Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 13223 in the name of Joan McAlpine on restoring the Caledonian Pinewood Forest. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak once now? And I call, call on Joan McAlpine to open the debate. Ms McAlpine, please. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure as species champion of our national tree, the Scots Pine, to introduce this debate today. The Scots Pine is symbolic of Scotland, a majestic tree whose distinctive silhouette on the horizon tells the Highlander that he's home. If you close your eyes and imagine a Scots Pine, you'll most likely visualise it solitary against the sky. But several millennium ago, the Scots Pine did not stand alone. It was part of what the Romans later called the Great Wood of Caledon. And at one time, it covered one and a half million hectares. It was Scotland's rainforest and included other trees such as birch, rowan, aspen and juniper. And it was carpeted with a lush variety of ferns, mosses and lichens and sheltered a vast array of wildlife, some of which, such as the lynx, brown bear and wolf, are long extinct. The ancient Caledonian forest now itself is threatened with extinction. Only 1% of the 1.5 million hectares survives and 84 separate fragments, some of them very small. And while that's a tragedy for my species, the Scots pine, it's also potentially heartbreaking for the animals and plants which continue to depend on our pine forests. The capercaillie, the red squirrel, the black grouse, golden eagle, Scottish crossbill, bill, pine marten, wildcat, twin plough and wood ant all are found in the forest and have a stake in its survival. And that's another purpose of this debate, to allow other members to champion their species and illustrate just how biodiversity works in practice. And I also want to say at this juncture that while the 84 areas of ancient woodland that I mentioned have been identified by the Forestry Commission as part of that old Caledonian uh, woodland, there are other pine forests elsewhere in Scotland, in particular my area of the south of Scotland, which um, are hundreds of years old as well uh, and are home to many of these species. In particular, I would like to mention uh, the Shambly Woods near New Abbey, which are certainly worth a visit. There's international recognition of the richness of Scotland's pine woods. They're, they receive protection from the EU Habitat Directive and are included in the Scottish Biodiversity List. But despite this, they face enormous challenges. These include overgrazing by deer, climate change, invasive and non-native species, and diseases such as Dothostroma, needle blight, which can cause defoliation and even death and which foresters have to be very vigilant of. So when the Trees for Life charity approached me to help promote their Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project, a partnership with the Woodland Trust, I agreed immediately. And I'm delighted to welcome Trees for Life to the gallery, uh, who are represented by Alan McDonnell and Fiona Holmes. The project is focused on those 84 surviving fragments of ancient forest and is supported by Scottish Natural Heritage, the Forestry Commission Scotland and Scottish Land and Estates. It offers owners a free survey of their wood to assess its ecological health and its resilience to the threats I've mentioned. And ecologists can then suggest ways in which these challenges can be met. It's a really positive, collaborative venture, which we all hope will contribute to the Scottish Government's aim of meeting the international biodiversity target to restore uh, 10,000 hectares of native woodland. So how does one go about assessing and addressing the ecological health of a pine wood forest? I decided to see for myself by visiting Trees for Life's uh, 10,000 acre flagship restoration project uh, Dundregan in Glenmoriston near Loch Ness. Uh, it was purchased entirely through fundraising 10 years ago and has been described as the most ambitious rewilding project anywhere in the UK. Through natural regeneration and planting more than a million saplings, uh, Trees for Life and their volunteers aim to create an unbroken native woodland link between Glenmoriston and the magnificent Glenafric to the north. This directly addresses the fragmentation which afflicts pine woods and will create a corridor to allow birds, plants and animals that depend on the woods to increase their range and flourish. Natural forest regeneration is hard work and my visit allowed me to see the enormity of the task. 
Doug Gilbert, Dungdragon Operations Manager, took me a walk up Glen Morriston to see a small clump of picturesque, very gnarled uh, Scots pine, which he said dated back to the time when the Glen was cleared of people after the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. And that is a poignant and romantic story in itself, of course. But as Doug pointed out, these 18th century survivors are poignant for another reason. Uh, they're known as geriatric trees. Once the estate was given over to sport in the Victorian era, few trees survived to maturity because deer devour saplings and young trees and only geriatric or what are called granny trees now survive and they eventually become infertile. So to combat this, Dundregan has an impressive tree nursery which allows conservationists to collect and grow pines and other trees on site. And it's very important for biosecurity uh, because of the diseases I mentioned earlier and also because it's more natural to propagate from local stock. The nursery workers spend a lot of time recreating the conditions in which the wild tree seeds are fertilised and dispersed by birds and animals. And they also grow species which they can then sell on uh, to earn an income uh, to sustain the charity. The work's very labour intensive and it illustrates that forestry generation can help sustain other species which we all want to see prosper in rural Scotland, uh, in particular human beings, because it's very labour intensive. Natural regeneration is considered vitally important, but young Scots pine trees are very vulnerable, especially in winter, when they pop up through the snow, advertising themselves as a tasty snack to any passing deer, who apparently prefer it to birch, which is the last tree uh, that they eat. Uh, the charity has begun using special clip-on shields uh, to protect the saplings, uh, and there's also fencing, of course, but that has a finite lifespan and is not foolproof. And there is a view amongst ecologists that fencing cages woodland and the creatures who live in it and uh, prevents natural spread. Dundragon employ a gamekeeper, which I believe they inherited from the previous sporting estate, and they also use some more innovative ways to keep the deer out, such as using groups of noisy volunteers to disturb them, and I'm told that bagpipes are particularly effective. <laughs> um, another threat to forestry generation is, of course, commercial monoculture, and some of the ecologists I spoke to asked whether it was right that natural regeneration attracts smaller grants uh, than commercial planting. But that debate is perhaps for another day. Today is an opportunity to focus on the Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project of Trees for Life and the Woodland Trust. I hope that members will use it to promote their own constituencies and their uh, own species. And, uh, and I hope that we will dwell uh, on how best to ensure that the ancient Caledonian pine forest does not become extinct. Uh, as the writer Ali Smith once said, the Scots pine may be noble and solitary, sculpted into a loneliness by the wind. But really, our pine is not a lonesome one. It is a much-loved companion to the crossbill, the red squirrel, the martin, the capercaillie, and many more. And that's why I hope it will flourish. And I have a pleasure in moving the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speeches of four minutes. Edward Mountain, followed by Claudia Beamish. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank Joe McAlpine for bringing this motion to the Chamber. Protecting our Caledonian pine woods is vitally important. Managing the hills of Scotland, where our Caledonian pines naturally gr grow, present unique challenges. Probably the most difficult one to predict is actually nature itself. I had the privilege of managing areas of upland Scotland for 12 years, and I believe help preserve the Caledonian pine woods that we're talking about. And I'd like to highlight tonight some of the issues involved in, in expanding the Caledonian pine wood that I'm sure we all agree is so important. One project I did was try and establish 600 hectares of replacement native Caledonian pine wood. And let me tell you, I have the scars to prove it. For years, we collected seed from registered Caledonian pines and propagated them. We took cuttings from trees and grafted them onto pine rootstock. Now, key to this project was to get a woodland grant scheme approval from the, the FC, and I thought that would be relatively simple. That was probably my first big mistake. The level of consultation that was required was massive. Six years later, hundreds of hours spent consulting every interest group that came forward, 
meant that we were no further forward except that I have thousands and thousands of trees sitting in a nursery outgrowing their pots. Some of the areas of contention were that pine woods would reduce the hunting grounds for eagles and thus birds group were against it. Some were against removing the rabbits, which was encouraged by SNH, but would reduce predators, uh, prey for predators. Pine would, would, would argued would re reduce calcareous grassland, which happened to be damaged by the overgrazing of the rabbits that were important to the raptor groups, but despised by SNH. Pedestrian gates and fences might put walkers off and thus not, were not supported by Ramblers Association, but approved by the Forestry Commission. Some groups objected that the scenic view would be curtailed by the trees, which were only going to then replace native woodlands that had died out. And on and on it went. One day one group supported it, the application, and the next day they didn't. There was, however, one constant in this, and that was the support by the Forestry Commission, because they knew, as did my client, was the importance of Caledonian pine wood. And I'm grateful for their support because it meant that eventually we did get the thousands of trees planted, which was so important to preserve the Caledonian woods. Now, I wish, as, a, uh, as an observation, that people sometimes would take a more holistic approach to try and achieve this. And, and I think that it's great that the uh, Cabinet Secretary has now streamlined the process for woodland grant schemes. And I hope that that's something that's going to be taken forward. I want to briefly mention Needlebright. Um, I'm not going to use the Latin name. I'm not, not uh, capable of doing that. I'll probably uh, get tongue-tied. But it is a problem that faces our pine woods across the UK. And the advice from the Forestry Commission is basically only to plant when it is deemed essential to the short-term survival and long-term integrity of the pine wood ecosystem. So that basically is telling us we need to encourage natural generation. And I believe they're right. We need to achieve that, and we'll probably have to fence, as Joe McAlpine has made clear, those fragile young pines, those tasty morsels, from all the animals that prey on them, which includes mountain hare, hares and deer pressure. Now, if fencing isn't acceptable, and I know it's not accepting, acceptable to everyone, then we'll have to accept that there needs to be a significant reduction in deer and hare numbers, which then in turn may be unacceptable to our other people. These are the real decisions that we have to make, and it's what the decisions that nature forces on land managers. And difficult as it is may, may be to make them, we have to make them. Presiding officer, I welcome this debate. I welcome the work for Trees for Life. I welcome the work of the Woodland Trust for Scotland. I welcome the work of private landowners who are trying to improve the situation. And I welcome the commitment of the Forestry Commission. All are working to, produce, uh, to promote our Caledonian pine woods. Jointly, as a parliament, we should support them and the hard decisions that they have to make, which are based on knowledge and not emotion. Thank you. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish to follow by Andy Whiteman. Ms Beamish, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and thank you also to Joe McAlpine for bringing this important matter to debate as a species champion for iconic um, uh, Scots pine. From Caledonian pine forests, uh, in the Scottish Highlands, to the Atlantic oak uh, woodlands in the western seaboard, trees provide us with a fabulous array of benefits. We value them for everything from recreation opportunities to the carbon they sequester and the home that they provide for some of our favourite wildlife, including red squirrels, woodpeckers, and species of global importance such as lichens and mosses found in our Atlantic woodlands. Both native woodlands and commercial woodlands also have an, um, are important sources of timber and other products, and this needs to be recognised as well. Our woods and forests are important national assets, and so it is evident that more of them would be beneficial. I wholeheartedly support any measure to bring sustainable biodiverse pine woods into places where they are suitable and to protect existing pockets of the ancient woods, which Joe McAlpine has highlighted, whether pines or the other species which um, are, are appropriate there. The ancient pine woods scattered across the northern parts of Scotland are an important part of our natural history and, with proper management, should remain an important part of Scotland's natural future. Climate change is a significant factor in the decline of the ancient indig indigenous Scots pine woods, and I understand that the trees can only thrive in relatively dry condition conditions, surprisingly. 
This is just one more example of why we have to have more joined up approaches to tackling individual issues and wider climate change problems. The two are unavoidably and inextricably linked. It is hugely important that natural woodlands are preserved and managed responsibly. Whether pine woods in the highlands or native hardwoods such as willow, ash, aspen in South Scotland. Carfren wood, Wildwood near Moffat in my region is a brilliant example of turning the ecological clock back 6,000 years and hopefully forward another 6,000 years. I would point out that it is confusing though to suggest, uh, and, and this just needs clarification I think, though perhaps not, I'm sure not for members here, that the work to maintain and promote the regeneration of the remaining ancient pine woodland is different to that of the monocultures that have been planted um, in, in um, previous times in, in Scotland. The Scottish Government has committed to afforestation targets and focusing on re-establishing our ancient wood pine woods alongside other native woods provides important benefits for biodiversity with the, with the Scottish Government targets. Again, I applaud the, the efforts of Trees for Life and the Scottish Woodland Trust in engaging with landowners to protect and regenerate ancient Scots pine woods. I would like to end by saying that no matter what species of trees or location, an often overlooked contribution to our biodiversity and natural environment is to ensure that areas of less intensive woodland are provided, especially corridors for wildlife. And finally, I do have uh, uh, two questions for uh, consideration by the Minister. Um, uh, the Eclair Committee, of which I'm a member, and the previous committee in the last Parliament had highlighted and, and has worked very hard on deer management arrangements, which um, uh, Joan McAlpine and Edward Mountain have both highlighted as well. The main challenge of restoration is large numbers of red deer grazing on young trees. And can the Minister give an update on the, rev the latest review by SNH in this context? And also, the Government has recently announced a Biodiversity Challenge Fund uh, in the programme for government. Uh, will projects seeking the restoration of ancient pine woods be eligible for that fund? And finally, uh, given the major challenge to the future of ancient Caledonian pine woods, is the disappearance of um, existing woodland? Does the minister have plans to prevent the loss of existing ancient woodland as well? Let's protect the Scots pine and our ancient forests and woodlands more broadly together to protect biodiversity and for the enjoyment of everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Call Andy Whiteman, followed by Gillian Martin. Mr Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Presiding Officer, and thanks, Joan McAlpine, for this debate. As someone who left school and went straight into forestry and spent a lot of time campaigning in Aberdeenshire to protect pine woods and Mar Lodge, etc., it's a delight to be able to talk about native pine woods. But the fact that we're talking about 1% and have been for the best part of half a century is testament to the brutalising, destructive and degrading forms of extractive land use that have dominated too much of Scotland for too long and people have mentioned members have mentioned excellent work that is being done by organizations like the rspb woodland trust trees for life and indeed the forest enterprise over long periods in places like glen Affric, for example and more recently by the archaig community forest and the woodland trust on the south side of loch archaig also by community groups such as burst community trust on the forest of burst commentary and also by private landowners some of whom have made significant efforts most notably Anders Paulson and his company Wild Land Limited in Glenfeshie. <clears throat> Presiding Officer Glenfeshie was where I learnt some harsh truths about land and power in my 20s. The estate's one of the jewels in the crown of our natural heritage, and yet has been owned and managed and abused by a succession of rapacious landowners, determined to manage it purely as a hunting playground, and in the process destroying one of the most important remnants of Caledonian Pinewood. In 1992, I was working in international forest conservation across the boreal region through the Tiger Rescue Network established in Jokmok in northern Sweden in 1992. And we used Glenfeshie and Mar Lodge as a powerful example of the hypocrisy of the then Scottish office and UK government, who along with many other northern governments were lecturing the global south on the need to conserve the tropical rainforest in their own countries, yet were presiding themselves over unprecedented levels of native forest destruction here. And our work with the global environmental community then helped to draw attention to the fact that the worst performing countries in terms of forest, forest protection were typically countries such as Scotland. And the then Secretary of State for Scotland, Ian Lang's press conference at the Earth Summit certainly did not go as he had intended. Conservationist Dick Bulhari was a key influence on me then. Dick sadly died in April 2015, but a week before he left us, he was awarded the Geddes Medal by the Royal Scottish Geographical Society for his lifetime achievement in conservation. 
and his involvement in Glenfeshie ran from 1964 to his death. And in his Geddes lecture, he argued, and I quote, traditional sporting estates cannot stand on the moral high ground of estate ownership as they have tried to claim for the last 200 years. Rather, they embody the selfish greed of a Victorian era, outdated and ludicrous. He was particularly critical of the use of fencing, we've heard that this evening, as a means to regenerate native forests. He had been instrumental behind the scenes in the very heated public campaign to protect what is now the Craig Meggie National Nature Reserve from being converted into a non-native commercial plantation that drew heavy criticism and political hostility from the then Tory government. As he argued in his lecture, the sad fact witnessed through Scotland today is that in many areas, fencing deer out of young native woodland has become a way to maintain easier stocking opportunities and to protect established relationships and social networks. In effect, many deer fences are built to protect the interests of the few. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has commissioned two independent reviews that could play a critical role in reviving the fortunes of our native forest. The Grouse Moor Management Group, chaired by Professor Alan Werrity, is due to report by June next year, and the Deer Working Group, which I think Claudia Beamish uh, mentioned, uh, reporting by the end of April. The latter was chaired until his recent tragic death by Simon Pepper, whose own efforts through WWF Scotland and on his own account over many years in advancing the case for the restoration of our natural environment and the place of people in it, I would like to pay particular tribute to, to, to today in this debate. Presiding officer, the core reason why Scotland's native pine woods are still dying is the continued preservation of vast tracts of Scotland as playgrounds for the idle rich to hunt all manner of Scotland's wildlife. Pol politi political will can change that, and I hope that it does so soon. Thank you. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Finlay Carson. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. I want to congratulate Joan McAlpine for securing this particularly relevant debate, which is timely given the Intergovernmental inter Panel on Climate Change's recent report. The IPCC's report points to the fact that an increase in global temperatures is a very real danger, and a debate around the protection and recovery of woodland is extremely pertinent in our efforts to provide and enhance the carbon sinks that can mitigate the effect of carbon emissions. Effects that will cause, a, cause us, cost us dear in terms of human health and well-being, as well as having a negative impact on our economy, something I think that really gets lost in the debate around this. We really have to ramp up the, the chatter around that as well. Before I go on to talk about the value of trees in climate change terms, I will proudly mention an interest as a species champion of the yew. Of course, Scotland's and Europe's oldest living trees are yews, and it's fairly likely that the ancient forests of Scotland would have had many yews in them. Trees have a vital role in the balancing of CO2 and oxygen levels, and in addition, widespread deforestation across the world has had a hugely negative impact by releasing more CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, and of course, it won't be lost in any one of the threats of the, the newly elected Brazilian Prime Minister on, on what his plans are for the Amazon. Um, however, what we have growing naturally in Scotland is not nearly reaching our potential for sufficient mitigation of carbon emissions. So we have, as a matter of urgency, to do what we can to regenerate lost woodlands. And particularly helpful in this battle around CO2 and climate change are the ancient Caledonian pine woods that are living on undisturbed soils. And the fact that this soil is undisturbed and protected underneath the ancient forest means it acts as one of our most efficient carbon sinks, locking up carbon. The Caledonian pine wood contributes significantly to the ecosystem that uh, we gain from, from native woodlands generally in Scotland. And it's the most relevant um, way of that we have of, of climate change mitigation um, and carbon sequestration. Pine trees also happen to be one of the top species that can sequester the most carbon. The work of Trees for Life to protect the existing areas of ancient Caledonian pine woods and to increase the extent of Caledonian pine wood across Scotland via tree planting programmes is a, a big step in the right direction for Scotland's efforts to tackle climate change. And I want to thank Trees for Life and the Woodland Trust for putting tremendous effort uh, in running the CPR project, along with their partners in Scottish National Heritage, Forestry Commission Scotland and Scottish Land and Estates. But I want to also end by paying tribute to those individual homeowners, primary schools, small communities and farmers who give over land to voluntarily plant indigenous trees with or without the help of any funding available. 
I'm coming from a rural constituency. I have many constituents who take their individual responsibility for planting indigenous trees to provide a degree of carbon sequestration and improve habitats for wild animals, birds and insect species. And I want to uh, specifically mention tree planting projects that I visited in my constituency in Kutakullen, uh, the village of Kutakullen and Fintory Primary School who have done new planting to play their part. In my area it's been proven that even the smallest tree plantation is enough to attract red squirrels, just one Scottish species that we know are under threat and I recognise that Gail Ross is a species champion sitting next to me for the red squirrel. Like everything with regard to environmental protection, the small actions of individuals and in taking responsibility cumulatively is hugely impactful. I thank Joan McAlpine for highlighting the work being done to ensure that this is done on a wide scale with the Caledonian forest. The forest will be uh, local protection against flooding, improved biodiversity, not to mention make a significant impact as we drive to become one of the world's first carbon neutral nations. Thank you. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Gail Ross. Mr Carson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd like to recognise uh, Joan McAlpine for bringing this important to subject to the Chamber and for the work that Trees for Life and the Scottish uh, Woodland uh, Trust are doing to, to preserve the Caledonian pine forest. I'm pleased to be taking part with particular relevance to, my, relevance to my role as the natural environment spokesman for the Scottish Conservatives. Barely a day goes by now when we're not hearing through the media or indeed working in this parliament that we need to do more to protect our natural environment and stunning landscapes. Now that's one of the reasons I'm an enthusiastic supporter of the Gallo National Park and I'm sure the Minister will find out uh, now she's in the role and, and why uh, debates such as this are so important in raising awareness of issues facing our natural environment and the amazingly diverse species that we have in Scotland. I'm also delighted that I'm taking part in this debate particularly, particularly tonight because I couldn't resist the opportunity to speak about the animal that lives and the Caledonian pine forest and other native woodlands. Tonight of all night, Halloween, I'm pleased to say that I'm the bat champion. <laughs> or more specifically, this species champion for the Lesler bat. The Lesler bat flies fast and high near the tops uh, of the trees. And if you're a toonie, you might also spot it flying around lampposts looking for insects attracted to the light. The Lesler bat forages for flies, moths and beetles locating its prey using echolocation. Sometimes you can even hear it uh, by the human ear if you listen out just before it emerges at sunset. But most importantly to this debate, it roosts in holes in trees as well as buildings. And you might even be lucky enough to attract one to live in your bat box. They are wee sweet animals that during the summer, the females form maternity colonies and they usually have one single pup. And during the winter, lesler bats mainly hibernate in tree holes, but occasionally in buildings or underground. The lesler bat has golden tipped or reddish brown fur, which is darker at the base and longer over its shoulders and upper back, giving it a lion's mane appearance. So it's very cute. Now, while the lesler bat doesn't specifically resi reside in pinewood forests, it does thrive in habitats of uh, native woodland. And the Deputy Presiding Officer will be delighted to know that one of the biggest colonies is just up the road from our former home in Minigaff at the Wood of Cree. And the UK bats and the roosts are protected by law, meaning that it's illegal to damage, destroy or disturb bats in their roost sites. A roost is defined as any place, and that can include a tree, for which wild bats use for shelter or protection. All bats in the UK feed on insects, and because trees can support a large variety and abundance of insects, they are really important for foraging bats. Native trees, like those in the Caledonian pine forest, support the greatest abundance of insects, with veteran or ancient trees being of particular value. Bats not only feed in woodland, but live within sheltered locations known as roosts within trees. And all UK uh, bats uh, utilize these natural features in trees uh, to roost. Now, I was astonished to discover that the native uh, uh, pine wood, which formed the westernmost outpost of the forests in Europe, are estimated of once to have covered 1.5 million hectares as a vast primeval wilderness of Scotland with pine, birch, rowan, aspen, juniper and other trees. 
And the deforestation has been to such an extent that the Tree for Life group, who helped to plant trees and bid to order, in, in order to restore it to some of its former glory, now that say that our generation is the last with the opportunity to save the Caledonian forest. We don't want to be accused of not seeing the wood for the trees, but it's not just about the trees. It's about the plethora of species that rely on it to provide them their homes and food they need to thrive. And I'm hugely grateful to Liz Ferrell of the Bat Conservation Trust for providing me with this information ahead of the debate tonight, which supplements the excellent bat walk we recently had in a Holyrood Park with bat, de bat detectors, and I can thoroughly recommend it to anybody who wants to give it a shot. In conclusion, once again, thank you to Joan McAlpine for bringing this to the Chamber and for the Tree for Life Group and Woodland, Woodland Trust for their hard work. We must continue to protect our species and champion them at every opportunity. And I'm pleased to have had the opportunity on Halloween to do that for the bat. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Can I just clarify, is it Leeser's bat, not Lesler. the lesser bat? Lesler bat. The Lesler bat. Yes. yes, I was wondering about the greater bat, but I understand now it's the Lesler's bat. I'm sure the OR will sort that all out. Um, now I call Gail Ross to be followed by Bill Bowman. And before I call you to your feet, Ms. Ross, can I just say that due to a number of members still wishing to speak in the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3. The de debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. We won't need 30 minutes, so don't panic. Uh, can I invite Joan McAlpine to move the motion? I move the motion. Uh, the motion has been put. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. And I'll call Gail Ross, followed by Bill Bowman, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. And I would also like to thank Joe McAlpine for taking this important debate to the Chamber and to agree that the Scots Pine is indeed a magnificent tree. In fact, I have a couple in my own garden. I'm a species champion for the red squirrel. Unfortunately, none of them in my garden. The expansion of our Caledonian pinewood forests offer hope for the species from the threats that are contributing to their decline. Red squirrels were once a common sight across the UK, but they've been in decline for decades, and Scotland is home to 75% of the estimated 121,000 reds that are left. Non-native grey squirrels are a major threat and are capable of arriving in an area and entirely wiping out the native population of reds within as little as 15 years. They do this by spreading squirrel pox, which is a virus that is fatal to reds, but not to greys. They can also be affected by habitat isolation. In broadleaf woodlands, grey squirrels have the advantage of being able to process tannins in food sources like acorns earlier in the year, helping them to outcompete the reds for food and territory. However, the reds don't suffer this disadvantage in the Caledonian pinewoods and have a much greater chance of establishing populations there. But at the moment, the isolation of many of the Caledonian pinewoods can leave red squirrels isolated with limited ability to face challenges like fluctu fluctu can't even say that, sorry. fluctuations in food availability or climate change. Very small, sparse patches of ancient Caledonian pine forests are not great for red squirrels. The canopies are so open and unconnected that squirrels don't often use them, and moving across heathery ground exposes them to too great a risk from predators. So connecting the pine woods will give red squirrels greater ability to develop strongholds and cope with difficult times, particularly by allowing them to look for alternative sources of food, allowing them to move across landscapes to seek the best shelter in the harshest of weather, and increasing breeding opportunities to help with recovery from periods of low population. Trees for Life and the Woodland Trust Scotland are currently running the Caledonian Pinewood Recovery, or CPR, and how appropriate that is, project with advice and guidance from Scottish Natural Heritage and Scottish Land and Estates. And a particular focus of the project is to work with private landowners and managers with what remains of the forest to identify the practical steps needed to first protect and then expand it. And as has been said already, the trees face particular challenges such as being eaten by deer, tree disease and climate change. Yes, of course. 
Keith Brown. Hey, can I thank the member for taking intervention? And just ask of her whether she's heard of the species for which I'm species champion, which is the sticky catchfly, which uh, lives where I live in the Oakle Hills and works where I, or lives where I work in uh, Holyrood. It only exists in those two places. And I mentioned just that not to test the member, just to try and get the word sticky catchfly in official report. Thank you. <laughs> You've I... been used, Miss Ross, but don't mind, Miss Ross. I thank Keith Brown for that very important sticky catch fly intervention. <laughs> I'm completely thrown off. <laughs> the project seeks to provide landowners with support and guidance to successfully apply for funding from the forestry grant scheme. And this will help with things like fencing, removing invasive non-native species and planting a range of trees associated with the Caledonian pinewoods. And presiding officer, I'm really happy to say that we've just had some great news and I would like to congratulate Trees for Life because they've just won a vote for a major European funding award. The Char is pioneering Red's Return Project has just been awarded more than £25,000 from the European Outdoor Conservation Association funding stream. So thank you to everyone that voted for the Reds. The money will fund a project to reintroduce red squirrels to four carefully chosen woodlands in the Northwest Highlands. And this will significantly expand the species numbers and range with the new populations able to flourish, safe from threats posed by the greys. And the project will also help the natural expansion of Scotland's native woodlands because red squirrels plant new trees by forgetting where they've buried some of their winter stores of nuts and seeds. <laughs> so on behalf of the red squirrels, thank you Trees for Life and everyone else that is involved in saving these iconic species. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Thank you, <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. And I too would um, like to thank the member for bringing this important debate. Now, until this particular debate here, I didn't realize I was sitting next just to Just bear back. with me a moment. Did you just Sorry, say your just farewells and go? That's it. I know what you were doing is fine, but Mr. Bowman was getting a bit distracted then. We don't want you distracted, well, Mr. Bowman. Well, not when I was trying to crack my joke, which was... <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, you can reprise it, would you? <laughs> that I didn't know until this debate I was sitting next to Batman. <laughs> what I was going to say. Oh, great joke. <laughs> but I don't know who... That probably makes Edward Mount and Robin, I hope, not, not me. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I think I, I'm actually more flower power because the, the speech... <laughs> well, thank you for that, um, um, a species champion for the twin flower, which I have the pleasure of learning about the Caledonian pinewood forest through it. And it's the importance to the twin flower during my visits to see it in the northeast of Scotland that I, I had this learning. The twin flower has two rather attractive pink bell-like flowers on a slender stem. And then there is a thicker stem which, below it which creeps across the ground to create the, this rather large mat of plant. In Scotland, twin flowers found only in Caledonian pine woods. Large patches of twin flower are an indicator of ancient or long established pine wood. Pine wood. Now, this is mainly because twin flower reproduces very slowly, is unable to spread quickly into new habitats, and thus is generally restricted to areas of ancient pine wood. The species has no special legal protection, so twin flowers' future in Scotland is directly linked to the future of the Caledonian pine woods. Many of the Caledonian pine wood remnants are only of aging Scots pines, as we, we heard earlier, reaching the ends of their lives. So the overriding priority is often to secure new generation of forests or trees for the future. The clearance of nature of native woodlands continued habit the clearance of native woodlands, continued habitat destruction, and changes in woodland management have now reduced this plant to a handful of about 50 unrelated sites. The twin flower is one of Scotland's most iconic flowers, often seen as an emblem of Scotland's ancient Caledonian forests. However, it's under threat and work has been undertaken to ensure that the Cairngorms National Park is a stronghold for the remaining population. The Cairngorms Rare Plant Project, launched in March 2010, aimed to deliver urgently needed action and was a partnership between the CNPA, Scottish National Heritage, and the University of Aberdeen. Past fragmentation of native pine woods has meant that the distances for pollinating insects to travel between patches of the twin flower are too great, 
and thus contributes to twin flower's continued decline, which has resulted in the twin flower being classed as nationally scarce in the UK. However, the project has developed innovative new methods to move carefully selected plants closer to existing patches of the twin flower. This pioneering project, alongside objectives to expand the area of native pine, pine woods, such as the Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project, should help to ensure that twin flower populations will be safeguarded long into the future. About 6,000 years ago, an estimated 1.5 million hectares of Scotland were covered in rich native pine woods. Now only about 1% of this original extent of forest remains, often as small and isolated fragments, and much of the wildlife dependent on the forest has been lost. Native pine woodland is categorised as a priority habitat under the UK Biodiversity Action Plan, and many populations of twin flower in Scotland are on designated sites, so the plant enjoys a fair measure of protection. However, it is still felt that further action should be taken to improve this plant's chances of survival in the country. Over the last two decades, there has been welcome enthusiasm for revitalising Scotland's old Caledonian pine woods. Management has focused on the regeneration of pine trees with the few remaining natural woods and creating new native woodlands. The Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project aims to save these remnant pine woods and over the next two years, Trees for Life, working in partnership with Woodland Trust Scotland, will work with landowners to promote their better management, thus restoring and protecting Scotland's unique pine woods for the future. So to conclude, I've uh, Glen Derry, Glen Louis and Glen Quaich, if I pronounce it correctly, are three areas where Cal Caledonian pinewood recovery will be concentrated. I was lucky enough to visit these areas in July this year during my visit to the Mar Lodge estate and the twin flower sites that reside there and hope to go back next year to see the continued success and recovery of the area and the twin flower populations. Thank you. Thank you. The things you learn in this chair about twin flowers and Bill Bowman, I'd never put the two together before. <laughs> I call on Marie Goujon to close with the government. Minister, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And I think it's always such a pleasure to be here uh, to, uh, in a species champ when it comes to a species champion debate. And I genuinely want to thank Joan McAlpine for bringing this motion to the chamber for debate, uh, because I think it is a vitally important issue that she's raised in terms of the Caledonian pinewood forest. But it also gives us a chance to hear a bit about some of the other species. Now, in terms of some... Of course. Uh, Edward Mountain. I wonder if the Minister would care to uh, accept that I was associated with a species called Robin, which is entirely incorrect. The species that I represent as species champion is golden plover, a bird from the high hills of Scotland. And does she agree it's a beautiful bird? I absolutely and thank Edward Mountain for clarifying Minister, that thank you. for yes. the official record. Now, just to... to uh, consider some of the points that were raised earlier. I know Claudia Beamish had to leave the chamber early tonight, earlier tonight, uh, but Andy Whiteman in, in his contribution tonight did answer one of those questions in terms of we will be hearing back from the, the Deer Working Group and the Werity Group next year. And I will write to Claudia Beamish with uh, responses to the other questions that she raised. But uh, in terms of some of the other contributions that we heard tonight, uh, Gillian Martin did raise a lot of very important points, but I think one element that was missing was uh, more about, about the yew tree. I, I was expecting to hear uh, to be regaled with tales of her Gothic youth, I believe, that she has raised in the chamber, which I think would have been very pertinent given the day on which we're discussing this. Uh, Finlay Carson uh, uh, and the bat was very interesting hearing about that and also very timely contribution as well. And Gail Ross and the red squirrel. And I'm actually very lucky because in my constituency, I mean, they are a, a very regular occurrence and, and fortunately a species that I happen to see uh, quite regularly. Um, but we really have had some uh, fantastic contributions tonight. And I would also welcome those from all of those in the south of Scotland as well. I spent quite a lot of time, well, particularly this week, traveling around the south of Scotland. And I was actually at the Barony campus this morning discussing the forestry strategy with uh, uh, young foresters and people involved in the sector who are really keen to contribute to that. Um, and it is it's a beautiful part of the world where forestry is a, a, a vitally important part. 
But as we have heard, the Caledonian pinewoods are dominant through the northern mainland of Scotland and they thrive on thin soils and low fertility conditions. Now, as well as being a beautiful and prominent component of our highland landscape, they create a, a vitally important habitat for wildlife from mosses to mushrooms and to pine martens. And the pinewoods are home to some of our most iconic and rare species, including Britain's only endemic species of bird, the Scottish crossbill, which is unique to Scotland. Now, individual, individual species are so important that, of course, as I've talked about, many members of this parliament are Scottish environment link species champion for many iconic or threatened animals and plants. And I had a meeting with the Woodland Trust last week where they told me about all the fantastic work that, that Joan McAlpine has done, and where they claimed that she was the best species champion, which, of course, I, I did personally take issue with but we'll let that one slide for now and I, as Joan talked about I didn't even realize they were called granny pines initially but they are immediately recognizable to those who are familiar with the Scottish Highlands but that may not be as well known for some of the iconic species for which they provide both home and protection so I'm really delighted to have had this debate in the chamber today to recognize their value and to really explore the opportunities for further enhancement and reputation now, these pines do create a very rich habitat, which is internationally recognised, as well as providing a home for common plants like bell heather and blaeberry. Other internationally scarce flowers grow alongside these, uh, including the twin flower. And I didn't realise that Bill Bowman was the species champion for that. And as he said, that is the emblem of Scotland's ancient Caledonian forests. Now, other rare and important uh, animals live alongside that, such as the red squirrel, as Gil Ross raised, and invertebrates such as the Scottish wood ant and the highly endangered pine hoverfly. Why? And we also can't forget the remarkable cultural and tourism importance that these forests have. They attract visitors from very far afield who come to enjoy the ancient green scenery of places such as Glen Affric, Abernethy and Rothy Murcus, and the incredible wildlife that we have there. And this is a beauty which has been brought to many across the world. Many films and television programmes have been dedicated to this. Uh, and they depict the Scottish Highland scenery and wildlife in all its true drama. Now, unfortunately, as we have heard, there are threats to the future and health of these iconic forests. Joan McAlpine discussed these in her opening remarks, such as browsing pressure, climate change, and invasive non-native plants. However, there is some good news. Actions are being taken by the government, public bodies, our partners, NGOs, communities and businesses to try and protect and improve the condition of this habitat. And this work is only effective with strong collaboration, coordinated effort and long-term commitment from all of us. And I'm glad that today's debate has shown how much of that is happening. Uh, Joan McAlpine talked about the positive work which has been done by Trees for Life and the Woodland Trust Partnership Project. And I'm very glad that they could join us for the debate tonight. And I would add my congratulations uh, to Gail Ross uh, for their recent funding award. Now, I'm pleased to hear that their project includes action on the ground and work to better understand these precious forests, because we have to have both if we're going to succeed and protect this unique woodland for the future. Now, this government is also a keen and active partner in work in the Pinewoods. Through Forest Enterprise Scotland, we're supporting an ambitious programme of conservation work, which has been underway since the early 1990s, to restore all the 22 remnants of native pinewoods in the National Forest Estate. Now, that's clearly a long-term project, which includes the iconic woods of Glen Affric, Blackwood of Rannoch and Glen Moor, back to thriving, healthy woodland communities, and to create the conditions which will allow them to regenerate and to expand. And with the completion of the devolution of forestry, Scottish ministers will be leaders in sustainable forest management and sustainable development through their stewardship of these assets. So no pressure at all there. But through our national parks, we're also leading conservation work for a number of pine woods, including Glen Falloch and Loch Lomond, which is the most southerly of our pine wood remnants. And I'm particularly pleased to hear about the positive conversations being had there to encourage owners to produce long-term management plans to bring these sites into good condition. And of of course, there's the Cairngorms National Park, famously contains some of the best remnants of the Caledonian pine woods in Scotland, such as Mar Lodge, Abernethy, Glenmore, and Rothy Marcus. And all of these are very enthusiastically supported by the National Park Authority. I also welcome the great innovations coming from others that we've heard about today. The Cairngorms Connect Partnership of four adjoining public and charity land managers, which includes the RSPB, Wildland Limited, Forestry Enterprise Scotland and Scottish Natural Heritage. Uh, and they were announced the successful award of a grant for approximately 3.7 million from the Endangered Landscapes Programme. Now that grant will fund the biggest habitat restoration project in the UK, which encompasses 600 square kilometres of land. 
The partnership will work on restoration projects across the landscape, including expanding and restoring Caledonian pine woods to their natural limit, uh, 1,000 metres above sea level. Now, the physical work on the ground is vital, but it needs to be underpinned by good information, as Edward Mountain mentioned in his contribution. The public investment in Scotland's Native Woodland Survey of Scotland, which was published by the Forestry Commission Scotland in 2014, is particularly valuable for that. The survey recorded that a high level of grazing by herbivores was the main contributor to the poor ecological condition of many native woodland habitats, including the Caledonian pinewoods. Now, of course, there are other threats and, and challenges. I was sorry to hear about the issues that Edward Mountain had when he was trying to do uh, his bit uh, for Caledonian pine forest uh, restoration. As far as I'm aware, that's not so much of an issue anymore. But uh, one other particular issue, um, under the Scottish Government's biodiversity route map to 2020, one of the areas we focused effort on is the reduction of browsing pressure. Grant support is available under the current Rural Development Programme for action to reduce browsing impacts and encourage regeneration on designated remnant Caledonian pinewood sites, which demonstrates our commitment to protecting and improving these important habitats in Scotland. We're also supporting work to identify and address threats from long-term climate change-induced pressure measures, which Gillian Martin emphasised in her contribution. That research suggests that the potential for future loss of biodiversity and species is high, and the smaller and more isolated the woodland, the more, more vulnerable it is to these losses. But as Gillian Martin and Claudia Beamish talked about, even these small areas of woodland are very important. Now, that's why we're helping these forests to adapt to future changes through actions which will encourage regeneration and expansion, and so build that greater resilience and adaptability. And all of that work is part of the Scottish Government's prioritised plan for meeting the international targets in our route map to 2020. We've taken an ecosystem approach which focuses on the need to protect ecosystems in order to support nature, including Scotland's native woodlands, and to support our own well-being and a thriving economy. Now, just to close, I very much welcome the attention which has been given to these important habitats, the efforts of the public, private and third sectors to secure them for the future, and I very much support the motion that was raised by Joan McAlpine today, which recognises the importance of this woodland and the threats it faces, and the work and the passion of all of those involved in its conservation. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.